Chapter 25 of A Sharper's Downfall or Into the Net. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Sharper's Downfall or Into the Net by Nicholas Carter. Chapter 25 The Truth at Last. While Chick and Patsy and Ida had been engaged on their various branches of the work, Nick had been busy in following up some clues that had drifted into his hands. So that, with what his assistants had discovered and reported to him, he had come to learn the full story of the relation of Ellison to Mrs. Ledoux and of Mrs. Ledoux with Jimmy Lanigan. And when Ida reported the results of her interview with Miss Rainforth, Nick realized that the rest of the story could be pieced out by Mrs. Ledoux, if he could induce her to talk. Without delay, then, he had hurried at once to Philadelphia and had followed Mrs. Ledoux to the department store where she met Lanigan. Believing from what he had learned of Mrs. Ledoux that she would not talk to him willingly, he had determined that he would use the knowledge of her escapade in New York with Lanigan as the means of compelling her. His success, he now felt, was as great as he could have hoped for. During the brief space of time taken to go from the ladies' parlor into the carriage, Mrs. Ledoux had evidently thought that her whole safety lay in giving her utmost confidence to the famous detective. A part of this lay in that impression of trustworthiness that Nick made upon all with whom he came in contact. And so it was that, when they were in the carriage and had driven out of the crowded streets into Fairmont Park, Mrs. Ledoux said impulsively, I shall tell you all, Mr. Carter, but if I do so, can I rely upon you to save me from the consequences of my folly? You can rely on me to the uttermost. I have no commission except to find Mr. Ellison and discover the mystery of his disappearance. I have no duty to perform in punishing anybody, but I will protect you and safeguard you from any trouble that may come out of your relations with Lanigan or with Mr. Ellison. Mrs. Ledoux turned on him, astonished. And do you know of that, too? Nick bowed his head and said, I do know of that. Now please answer the question I asked you before we left the ladies' parlor of that store. What message did that man bring to Mr. Ellison that made him respond so promptly? The message was that if Mr. Ellison did not at once go see the wife he had married in England six years before, and who was then nearby, she would appear at that reception and expose him in the presence of everybody. This reply was as near a shock to the famous detective as he, used to startling announcements, could have. He had not contemplated any such complication. But he promptly asked the next question. Did you know of that previous marriage? Not until that afternoon. What did you then learn? I learned that Mr. Allison had married, secretly, a young woman of great beauty who was a barmaid in England, but from whom he had been separated almost immediately, that for a large sum of money she had consented to consider the marriage annulled and that for several years he had seen nothing of her. Very shortly after Mr. Ellison came to this country, I made his acquaintance, and he began to come to Philadelphia quite frequently to see me. Our relations were quite intimate, and he was a frequent visitor at my house was on good terms with my husband. It seems that a brother of this girl lived in Philadelphia, and one day met him on the street, recognizing him as the young fellow who had been married to his sister, and who had paid a large sum to be free from that marriage. Just how Mr. Ellison became acquainted with a set of men of whom Mr. Lanigan was one, I don't know, but he did, and being fond of cards and gambling, he began to gamble with them. I have been told that he lost large sums of money to them and that they hold his notes for sums to be paid when he was married to Miss Sanborn. This man, the brother of his former wife, while not of the party with whom he gambled, was yet in close relations with Lanigan, to whom he told his story. I had had a bitter quarrel with Mr. Ellison before I ever met Mr. Lanigan or even knew there was such a person. It was not until some time after that I even knew Mr. Lanigan was acquainted with Mr. Allison, but I have come to know that Mr. Lanigan knew of my relation with Mr. Allison. What I do know is that this brother, whose name is Close, wanted to blackmail Mr. Allison, 
but Mr. Lanigan simply told Close that, even if he did expose Mr. Allison, the result would not be money, but merely the breaking off of his match with Miss Sanborn. It is only since the marriage that I have known all these matters. Under the guidance of Mr. Lanigan, Close put himself into relations with Mr. Allison and told him that he was free to go on with the marriage of Miss Sanborn because his sister was dead. But he sent for that sister hurriedly to come to this country. As I learned, the intention was to have her here a day or two prior to the marriage and then force him, on the eve of his marriage, to another compromise or payment of a large sum. Their program was checked by the non-arrival of the sister in time. About the attempt of Mr. Lanigan to rob the Sanborn house of the jewels, I know nothing. But now that you tell me if such was the case, I can see that that was intended and that I was to have been made use of to that end. It was at first arranged that Mr. Lanigan was to attend the reception with me. But the fact that I learned that some Philadelphia people were to be there who knew him broke up that arrangement. The sister of Close, Ellison's wife, arrived in this country on the morning of the wedding. That morning, Mr. Ellison was informed that she was not dead, but was in this country and demanded to see him. Mr. Ellison refused to believe it. Mr. Lanigan says that the plan of summoning him from the reception was decided upon very hastily and that his valet was bribed to assist in it. Close was sneaked into the house by the aid of the valet, and Mr. Allison was taken to him in a room which he had been placed. There, Close showed Mr. Allison a letter from his wife, who declared that if he did not immediately see her in a carriage that was in a nearby street, she would make her appearance and prove her former marriage to Mr. Sanborn. Mr. Allison, convinced that she was there, yielded and took the coat and wig and false whiskers that Close had brought for the purpose and slipped out of the house, intending to return very quickly. He entered the carriage, and, being an obstinate and high-spirited man, by the time the brother reached them, they were in a bitter quarrel in which Mr. Allison had recklessly defied them to do their worst declaring that he would lock them both up for extortion and conspiracy. Then the brother, finding that Mr. Allison was not to be handled, chloroformed him and drove him away. The valet, frightened over the result, fled from the city. Nick had listened to this story in utter astonishment. The facts, as they had been revealed, were wholly different from what he had imagined. It was true, as Miss Rainforth in her second anonymous letter to him had hinted, that a woman was at the bottom of the disappearance. But the woman was by no means the one she had supposed. Miss Rainforth had believed that Mrs. Ledoux was concerned in that disappearance, and such belief had been inspired by her jealousy of that woman. In the recital of Mrs. Ledoux, it was clear that she had no part in the disappearance but only a guilty knowledge of the event. All that she knew had been told her by Lanigan, who had either given this to Mrs. Ledoux for a purpose not apparent to Nick, or in that weakness strong men often show in their relations with women. What was expected to be gained by taking Mr. Ellison off? asked Nick. Nothing, replied Mrs. Ledoux. The abduction, if you can call it abduction, became necessary because of the attitude that Mr. Ellison assumed. He is a man slow to anger, but when aroused fully, almost a lunatic in his temper. At such times, he casts all thought of prudence aside and becomes utterly reckless and unmanageable. Mr. Lanigan tells me that when he discovered the plot and that it was the intention to force him to sign a legal document that would compel him to pay a large sum of money for their silence, he fell into one of those ungovernable fits of passion so that there was nothing else to do but to chloroform him to keep him quiet. It was that which made the mysterious disappearance. Mr. Lanigan must have been in the plot, said Nick. He was. Did you not know of it? Not until the evening of that day, last night. Did you then not know that Mr. Lanigan was not a straight person? asked Nick. I could not help but know it then, replied Mrs. Ledoux. I knew that he was a gambler, but I did not know that he was a thief and a burglar, as you say he is. And yet it must be so. What is the plan now? 
Mrs. Ledoux shuddered. Here is where danger is to me, she said. After having chloroformed him and carried him away, they did not know what to do with him. Their whole plans were upset. But they have now determined to hold him until he is ransomed. And you have been made a party to this, asked Nick, jumping to a conclusion. Yes. Mrs. Ledoux startled Nick by bursting into a passion, the depth of which Nick, who had judged her to be a weak, superficial, reckless woman, did not think her capable of. Oh, the blackness of it, the humiliation, the degradation. Lanigan showed himself to me today in all his villainy and would have pulled me with him if you had not interfered. What was it he proposed? asked Nick. Using the power over me he has gained, he called me to him where you saw me and forced me to consent to see Mr. Allison tonight to act as the means of getting the money they desire. See him tonight? asked Nick. Where could you see him? Here, in Philadelphia. He is to be here. Where? I do not know, but Mr. Lanigan is to let me know and to take me to the place where Mr. Ellison is to be, or is now, for all that I know. Nick was thoughtful for a time, and then he said, Can you go with him without discovery? Easily. Then do so, said Nick. I shall be on hand to protect and save you. I promise you that you will not even be compelled to meet Mr. Ellison, but you will be followed to the place where you are to meet him, and rest assured that I will protect you to the very last. He turned sharply to the woman and said, Are you ready to break with this man, Lanigan? Or are you anxious to continue your friendship with him? No, no, she cried. After what you have told me, I do not wish to see his face again. Then rest assured that you will be free of him if you will do this as I want you to do. I pledge you my word that afterward you will not be troubled by Lanigan. This being arranged, Nick asked Mrs. Ledoux to hurry back to the city, as he had much to do in preparing for the night's work. Half an hour later, he left the coach with the understanding that she was to communicate with him the hour at which she was to meet Lanigan for the purpose he had asked her. As he stepped from the coach, he saw Patsy, who had faithfully followed him as Nick had directed. He went to him, saying, Hot work tonight, Patsy, but we will end it before midnight. End of chapter 25 Read by Paul Hampton